I hope you're all enjoying your weekend. I'm back to talk to you a little bit about an, an action that you may or may not have noticed. Um, so there's many ways to invoke HTTP requests in Flow. And uh, one of my favorites, for those of you who are using a lot of SharePoint data in order to achieve your goals, um, we've added the send an HTTP request to SharePoint. And it's not new, it's been there for a while, um, but I just wanted to make sure you were aware of it. Um, one of the major reasons why this one is going to be a favorite of yours if you're on SharePoint is that it can do things that we have not included in the out-of-the-box SharePoint connector. So in some cases, um, and I'll just cite one thing, like if you wanted to create a list, there's no create a list action in the SharePoint connector. You can find it in Plum Sale, but then if you use a third party connector, there may be cost associated with that. And so um, you might not be willing to pay that cost, in which case this action can come in very handy. So that's the first reason that I love it and wanna share it with you today. We're going to talk about five different hacks using this HTTP request. And every now and then I'll throw out more because there's many things you can do with this, okay? Um, but the second reason that it's really special com in comparison to the others is it's aware of SharePoint. So it'll give you the SharePoint list name. It'll handle the authentication. So basically... You, you can skip over some of the things that you would have to do if you were using one of the other uh, actions, okay? So let's kind of break down what it, you know, the components of send an HTTP request to SharePoint right before I show you your five hacks, okay? And feel free to fast forward if this is not important to you. So uh, what we're gonna do today is we're going to use an HTTP requests for SharePoint to create a list on a given SharePoint site. So when we create this action, we will be asked what SharePoint site. So it'll just be a drop down, and we'll be able to use that drop down to, um, to indicate the site name first. Um, you can include an action before that that has a variable with the site name if you plan to do a lot in your flow, not just this. Um, but I find it really easy just to select your site name. Um, the next thing is to decide what are you going to do with your requests? So there are several methods associated with HTTP requests. I don't want to make this a university on HTTP because it's a big topic, but the two that you'll probably use are post and get, okay? And they kind of they kind of give you a clue of what they're doing. Post means something will be added to SharePoint in one way or, on, or another. Get means you're querying SharePoint. You're asking a question of SharePoint. So for the most part, you're gonna be using a post or a get. Today, I'm gonna be doing a lot of posting just to show you what you can do as a flow maker in SharePoint. The next thing that's kind of important is the URI. So this is kind of the HTTP URL that will be used to perform the action. And depending on what you're gonna be working with on SharePoint, you're going to use different uh, URIs. So because this one is creating a list, I'm gonna use the underscore API slash list. If I were trying to create a folder, I would use underscore API slash web slash folders. So there are different things that you will be working with and so you will need the right URI. So in the description of this video, I'm gonna put um, a little page link where you can find out what the URIs are that are available to you. I think I might just give you the ones that I use the most in the description as well. Next, there can be headers. I find with SharePoint, we need two to three to four. So I'll say two to four headers. You can get away sometimes with just one, um, but the headers kind of set the framework of how this is going to be, uh, what, what are the uh, requirements for this uh, from a uh, HTTP perspective? What's, what's needed to understand? And so you're kind of passing these headers um, 
And I find that the right side is usually the same when it comes to accept and content types. And these are the two most popular ones. In other words, if you're doing a different one that I'm not doing and you try these two, you're going to be surprised that most of the time you're going to be, that's going to be good enough. Okay. Sometimes you need others, like you might need, uh, whenever you're updating things, you know, that exist already, I find that you might need merge or you might need a, a request header. Um, but normally when you're doing like just posting and you're not editing anything that exists, you can get away with, with just these two. And then finally is the body. Now, those of you that have ever done, uh, maybe you are power apps users and you've done a patch. This totally reminds me of patch. It is, it is 100% JSON, but it really reminds me of patch in the sense that the property name has a colon after it. And then after that colon is the value that you're putting into that property name. In this case, we're not talking about, um, in this particular case, we're creating a SharePoint list. So most of these bodies will start with metadata and then indicate what type we're referring to. So, and this is a mistake I've made in the past. It's two underscores, <clears throat> not one. All right. So in, in this, right, I have the metadata, which is a type of some kind. It could be sp.data and something else. It could be sp.list. It could be SD, sp.folder. So it totally depends on what you're doing, but you'll start to see a relevance between the type and the URI. I'll, you'll notice there's a relevance there. Okay. Then each one of those types. So have their own set of properties and these are pretty long. I mean, there's a lot of things, um, available to you in HTTP for the properties of SP list. I only chose a few here because that's what I was looking to do. So in this case, we're creating a list and I'm saying in the list settings, should the content types be true or false? Should you allow content types? I put true. Maybe I'm planning later on to pick a different content type. Who knows what I'm planning to do? But if I need to use content types, I need to set that content type, allow content types to true. I don't always need this though, okay? By default, allow content types will be false. I can also choose a template. And now this is the cool part um, of lists. There are a list of templates. Some of you may have used them in the past, but these are the templates that decide what this is going to, what kind of list this is going to be. So like 101 is like a standard custom list. I mean, 100 is a custom list. 101 is like a library, a folder. Um, then you have like 107, 108. You have these numbers that might be task lists or survey lists. Remember those? Um, so by picking the right template, you can get the list type that you want. And I'll show you, um, a standard custom list and I'll show you a task list in case that's something you want to create. Now content types enabled is also true. These two usually go together. So you don't need them unless you need them right? Those of you that work with content types, I do. So I, I have them shown here. Then here's a description of your list. So this is the description you see for the entire list. And this is the list name. Now, of course, in any of this, I can use dynamic fields. Isn't that awesome? Okay. So that's the basic intro. We're going to learn how to do this, how to test it. And I'm going to give you five hacks. This was just like the preliminary video to kind of tell you the scope of this. So it's the part one, head over to part two to see the hacks.